Oxygen is most commonly seen as gas, but under certain conditions, we can see it as liquid. It is actually the temperature and the pressure that determines whether something will exist as a gas, a solid, or a liquid. In the atmospheric pressure that we live in, oxygen is a gas, but if we increase the pressure enough or lower the temperature enough, we can put it back into a liquid or even a solid. This can be pretty easily visualized in a graph, which is known as a phase diagram. At home, putting something under extreme pressure is kind of hard and dangerous, but cooling it down is much easier and safer. The boiling point of liquid oxygen is slightly higher than liquid nitrogen, so what we're going to do is we're going to use liquid nitrogen to condense oxygen gas. So for this experiment, we're going to need some liquid nitrogen, and we're also going to have to make an oxygen gas generator. I actually covered this in a previous video, and it goes into more detail, so I'll provide a link below in the description. While I'll just be playing with the liquid oxygen and testing out some of its properties, it does have practical applications. I won't really be covering its uses, but I thought one interesting one was as a liquid oxidizer for spacecraft. Anyway, that's enough of an intro, and let's get to making some. So this is my oxygen generator setup, and it looks a little bit complicated, but it's actually quite simple. The addition funnel above is filled with 3% hydrogen peroxide, and the three-necked round-bottom flask has some manganese dioxide in it. The manganese dioxide acts as a catalyst, and when the hydrogen peroxide touches it, it breaks into water and oxygen. The oxygen is pushed out of the neck on the right and down a tube containing drying agent. In my case, I used calcium chloride, and it's important to dry the oxygen because it will be carrying quite a bit of water with it. The oxygen is now dry, and it passes through a little bit of hosing which leads into a test tube. This test tube will be put into some liquid nitrogen so the oxygen condenses. So now liquid nitrogen is transferred from the large doer into a vacuum thermos. The liquid nitrogen will initially boil a lot as it cools down the inside of the thermos. The vacuum thermos is then placed below the test tube and it can now be lowered inside. The moment it touches the liquid nitrogen, it starts to boil rapidly, and this can be limited if it's lowered in slowly. I was a little bit impatient, so I lowered it in quite quickly, and you can see a lot of splashing occurs. So now we're ready, and we can start generating our oxygen. The hydrogen peroxide is dripped in, and you can immediately see that a reaction is occurring. It's important to use a lower concentration of hydrogen peroxide so that your reaction flask doesn't get too hot. Keeping it cool isn't really a matter of safety, it just means the hotter it gets, the more water it's going to pass over. On the test tube side, it doesn't really seem like much is happening, but there is oxygen condensing inside. After it's running for a while, you can see a pretty decent amount of water starts to come over. However, the drying tube works pretty well, and not much of the water makes it through. So when we think we have enough, we can take it out of the liquid nitrogen, and we can see that there is quite a bit of liquid oxygen. However, the tube is so cold that it quickly ices over. Using a paper towel, I wipe off the ice, and you can see the nice pale blue color of the liquid oxygen. For our first experiment, we pour some liquid oxygen into a beaker, and we lower some pre-ignited steel wool into it. As an added bonus, my friend offers an excellent commentary to the reaction. You just broke your beaker. If we used a finer grade of steel wool, the reaction probably would have occurred quicker and smoother. Because we used very thick grade of steel wool, it left a lot of large molten globules on the bottom. These globs of iron oxide or rust were actually so hot that they melted into the glass. And as my friend pointed out, the beaker broke due to the tremendous amount of heat that was produced in the reaction. From the large test tube, I transfer some of the liquid oxygen into a smaller tube. As it cools down the test tube, it boils a lot, but eventually it settles down. 
And then for the second classic experiment with liquid oxygen is we drop a flaming match into it. When the match is near the opening of the tube, you can see it burns brighter due to the oxygen. When this match is dropped in, it will also burn until it disappears. This can be done over and over again until there's no liquid oxygen remaining. When the test tube is removed and all the liquid oxygen is gone, you can see that the only thing remaining is a little bit of each of the match heads. The wooden part of the match is oxidized all the way to CO2 and escapes as a gas, but this part when it's oxidized is not a gas and remains in the tube. And for the final demonstration, we'll show the paramagnetic properties of oxygen. Oxygen molecules are always paramagnetic, but when it's in its gas form, the molecules are moving way too quickly to really be affected by magnets. Paramagnetic simply means that it's attracted to a magnetic field, but once it leaves, it's no longer magnetized like, let's say, iron can be. When we place a magnet next to the liquid oxygen and pull up, we can actually see a small glob of liquid oxygen going with it. And when we pull the magnet away, the drop falls back down. So that's really all I have to show for liquid oxygen, and just for good measure, I'll drop one last match into what remains. So remember, if you're interested in seeing something in a future video, just drop a suggestion in the comments below. Also, as usual, if you want to keep up to date with my videos, be sure to subscribe.